Well, welcome everybody to another Rockspace Office Hours. We have a couple of uh, topics we're going to cover today, but want to welcome everyone to our show. It's a weekly thing we do to uh, just kind of cover some of the topics that we hear uh, being discussed and uh, that kind of deserve a little more time. Um, I'd like to welcome our co-host, Alan Bush, here. Uh, how you doing, Alan? Great, great. Always good to be here. Good to hear. Glad to have you. Absolutely. Um, Glad to uh, to be back after our holiday weekend on the fourth. We uh, we skipped the the day of the third since we had uh, plenty of vacation and uh, hot dog and explosive times uh, ahead of us. Came back with ten fingers. You're doing better than I am, but uh, oh no, it's there, it's there. It's uh, movie magic. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll add it back in in post production. Uh, speak, speaking uh, of which, we are going to put you in front of something amazing in post-production, I'm sure. You're sitting oh, yeah. in front of the That's, green screen wall. I picked the green screen for just that reason. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Good. So we're excited about the fun things to be able to do with that. Um, well, on this show, we really want to talk about um, things that are going to be applicable to customers and um, you being the customers out there in the world watching this uh, live or in the future. Um, one of the ways that you can interact with us and show, uh, share with us things that you'd like for us to specifically touch on um, are through commenting in Google+, commenting in YouTube, tweeting at us. Um, we have our, uh, our handles down here. Um, also, you can interact live with the Q&A app. So uh, there's actually a question I've pre-populated there, but you can go through Google Plus to uh, ask questions that we can actually answer live while we're uh, talking through this. Um, my guess is that this show is going to be a little bit uh, shorter form than usual, but uh, we wanted to try a little bit of a shorter form factor with a topic that we still find valuable, and we're looking forward to uh, doing so. So that topic today is uh, kind of the skill sets or uh, kind of personas of the individuals or skills you'll need to start a website. Uh, everything from concept to full-on production, um, there's going to be a handful of of personas or people uh, that you'll need. You don't necessarily have to have an individual for each of these roles. Um, um, definitely work with guys trying to bootstrap a concept that um, were passable at all of these things and could get something off the ground um, themselves with these skills. But these are the personas that really um, come into play in developing, designing, and deploying an environment. So, um, yeah, this I, is Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I think this is more of like, you know, the what happens to people wear uh, conversation. So, I mean, over the course of, of running just about any application, uh, any project, you can see a lot of different people uh, wearing a lot of different hats, uh, pursuing a lot of different roles, and, and I think that we can discuss a, a few of them just kind of in some broad buckets here. But, uh, yeah, this is kind of distill down um, what some of those roles are. Yeah, and, and I'm sure we'll actually miss a few because... Um, there are going to be case-specific uh, components, but this is a pretty broad uh, cross-section that we're going to cover, and uh, some of these may really be uh, heavily leveraged at certain times um, of the of the project lifecycle, and then you'll have you know your just need to have a hired gun for a short period of time to knock this thing out because it's not expertise I have, and then depending on your business again, you'll have some of these roles that you'll want to have. Uh, full-time, round-the-clock, 24-7 um, expertise at your fingertips. So if that's uh, your willingness not to, um, to s ever sleep and do these things in the middle of the night when an uh, alarm goes off, or, uh, or if you're a kind of situation where you have a large organization that can kind of cover everybody's back on an eight-hour workday, then, um, then that would be the approach you would take. Yeah, you know, I think it's, I think we see that a lot with, um, uh, with with projects that are kind of just uh, just started up really quickly, and, and somebody has an idea for an application, a website, something like that, and they and and they build a, a project out really quickly, and then as it matures, you sometimes say, you know, I, hey, I do want to sleep at some point in time, so let's bring in somebody else, or um, you know, I I don't know how to uh, do this one uh, this one aspect of the project. Let's bring in somebody that can help out with that, and then. Uh, teams like uh, organically start to grow from there. Uh, that's a great way to uh, to see them uh, grow. Uh, also, a lot of times you have a a couple of variables. Maybe the the speed at which you need to move 
precludes you from being that expert. You could probably hack through it um, if given enough time, but there is not enough time to actually uh, be able to strike on an opportunity you've come across, um, and you need to bring in an expert who can knock it out much more quickly. And that's a problem that I know I run into um, quite a bit. I'm technical enough that I can usually um, get through uh, a problem eventually. However, uh, I sit around people who are often um, multiple times more technical than I am and have expertises that um, could do the same project in a third of the time. Those are the kinds of situations where, depending on your, uh, your timing, it may make sense to go ahead and, and hire in that, uh, that expertise so you can knock out those types of problems very quickly and you'll have them ready to go. Absolutely. Let's get into the, the list a little bit. Um, we um, just generally uh, there are a hands full of, of roles, and so I'm just going to list off some of these roles, and then we'll talk through customer lifecycle when these roles would really be leveraged most. Um, and it's kind of been grouped into the most clear and obvious, uh, down to the, probably the ones that you might not think of uh, right off the bat. So first, content creator. Um, a website without content is a worthless thing. There needs to be something uh, there to draw people, or there's no point in spending any money to have it um, around. So content creator is an important role. Uh, website designer. So uh, that can actually kind of play a few different ways. There's the developer type designer. There's the UX type designer. There's a visual. Um, but a web designer is going to be a necessary component to this conversation. Um, an app developer, if there's going to be more complex uh, things happening, you're providing a service as well. Um, then you need someone who can design that application uh, using uh, languages and, and putting together uh, pieces of code to deliver a functionality. Uh, but then you're going to need a system administrator, somebody who understands the infrastructure and how those uh, underlying components function to provide the horsepower for that code. Um, Within that, there's a subset, a database admin, someone who can understand the data that you have, how to manipulate that data well, um, and then a system architect, so someone who can structure physical components or virtualized components in such a way that you can um, optimally deliver the horsepower needed for, for that site. So that's kind of the, uh, the high-level overview. Now let's kind of walk through um, in a little bit more depth uh, a life cycle, and we can sit on who's going to be responsible for what, and how they're going to be most valuable. Yes, yeah, so I, I guess we we'll start kind of in the concept phase, and, and um, you know, if, uh, if, let's say, Drew and I are sitting around one day and saying, hey, uh, wouldn't it be great if there was a website that would uh, let us know uh, certain events that are happening around town? And, uh, okay, well, how, how might we go about that? And so and we can we'll start from there, and, uh, you know, we might uh, enlist the help of somebody that can, uh, go around and, and uh, look for uh, various uh, goings on around town and kind of uh, you know grab those for us and, and that would be you know your content person that would be going out and actually getting that content and getting it ready uh, uh, getting it ready right just in this uh, one example um, but then uh, that, that might not necessarily be the uh, be as important in the content phase we might want to look more at you know okay how are we going to Present this content uh, to the world. So, um, yeah, we've got a good idea of, of how we're going to collect this content, but now let's talk about how we're going to present this to the world. And I think that's where we start to uh, work with a an application developer uh, that would look at, all right, so how, what are we going to be working with? How are we going to uh, parse out these different data types and, and present them to the world? And I think that's where the application developer and uh, probably a database administrator would start to uh, work together. Uh, certainly, and there's going to be um, elements of uh, usability and uh, user experience design, uh, visual design here, as well as the structural design, the underpinnings of that code and how it functions together to deliver that, uh, that experience. And so we're still in the concept phase here. We've, we've got a, a reason for being. We've got content we can share, and now that we've designed um, a way to present that, we're going to need to talk through um, how do we how do we put the resources behind it to actually produce uh, that website so that you can actually go visit that at whatever load you expect to have 
Um, and that's where you start bringing in the system administration and also you start bringing in the, uh, the architect. So those two components, the system administrator is going to understand the operating system. The uh, components that are going to serve as uh, underpinnings to produce uh, that website. So are you going to use Apache or are you going to use Nginx? Well, that's something that uh, uh, the developer and uh, sysadmin are going to be working together to, uh, to discern. Are we going to use um, SSD infrastructure or are we going to use SATA infrastructure? That's something that the architect and the admin and the developer are going to be working together on. And so um, this is the, uh, the actual construction phase. So in an in a architectural um, side of things, we're going to be talking about um, the architect doing the design and then taking that to someone who can actually uh, be a contractor and be the project manager through the build. So actually um, getting somebody to pour the foundation and framing out the building itself. So there's going to be um, all of these different roles that are brought in. And, and like I mentioned earlier, there, there are guys who can, uh, can bootstrap this whole thing on their, own, on their own expertise for a period of time. But... Uh, the types of things you need to be expert at to do all of these things we've discussed, um, you're probably not going to be um, expert or savant level um, at all of them. You may be a fantastic uh, UX guy or uh, an incredible infrastructure architect guy, but you're probably not going to be incredible at all of these things. Yeah, it's going to be rare that you're that you're going to find someone that's that, that's um, wearing uh, or a master of all of the. Uh, all of those things. A lot of times you're going to wear all the hats, and that actually uh, looks like a question that uh, somebody asked here. Tyler, can you ask, answer that uh, uh, that second question about startups? There, uh, we'll go ahead and talk about that. I think that that, that brings up a nice question. Uh, some handsome gentleman in a uh, in a bow tie with a mustache asked, "In a startup atmosphere, a lot of times these roles are consolidated into just a few people. How would this affect the development of a website? Uh, is this for better or for worse?" And and one thing real quick, I think we keep saying website. Um, we're talking website application, any number of any number of things. We can probably use those interchangeably. But um, this is definitely something that we see quite a bit. Is um, as a project goes from back of napkin to uh, being bought for you know fifteen billion dollars by uh, by Apple uh, or Google or something like that. Um, you know, it's going to go through a lot of iterations. But I, I do think that it, it, oftentimes it is. It's a double-edged sword, right? We have one person that is in control of. Uh, of all of it, you look at um, you know auteur theory in film. You know when, when Quentin Tarantino writes and uh, produces and directs a film, he has very tight control over it. Um, when uh, you know he might just come and just direct a film, it might not be as tight and controlled and polished as as he uh, you know something that he has complete control over. So yeah, uh, but at, at the same time, he probably sleeps a little bit better at night when you know he's just doing that one thing. So that's the type of thing that is is definitely a trade off, and it's that double edged sword is. Is how involved do you want to be? How involved do you need to be? And um, you know, who else? What other resources do you have at that time to, to help you out? Yeah, absolutely. And tracking down the right um, the right people to partner with is definitely um, a difficult piece, but one that can be make or break. So, um, if you're in an accelerator and you're the business guy, uh, getting the right CTO is going to really be a, a huge piece of that. Or finding the right business partner or who um, can really own and, uh, and excel in a couple of these areas that you don't have the expertise in, again, is going to be that make or break. There are, um, in, in your auteur um, conversation there, there are guys who uh, really excel in a few places and need help in maybe editing. Maybe they can't keep their story concise and no one's going to go watch a three-hour movie no matter how uh, visually stunning it is and how much character development there is. Someone needs to be there to edit. Um, and so it's the same sort of uh, conversation in this process. Um, kind of one of the undercurrents that, um, that I'm sure uh, viewers of this specific show are, are getting is uh, we're a support company. We offer some of these things. Um, but we don't offer all of them, and there's going to be situations where um, you'll want uh, a very specific set of skills uh, for a very specific reason. So definitely worth 
doing the homework to find what's going to be the right amalgamation of components that's going to best deliver my user. Right. Um, and this is something we've mentioned before on this uh, specific show is one of the best things that a startup can do is get a, a, a chief technical officer in place. Um, we mention quite frequently the term technical debt, and, and that's, you know, decisions that you make on day one are going to impact you on uh, day 100, day 1,000. And um, changing over your architecture a year or two into it is, is going to be a very big headache. And so bringing in somebody that can act as a, uh, as a visionary that can really work with, um, uh, you know, really work with you and, and to uh, guide that through is really going to help out a lot. Uh, so if you, you, you don't want to necessarily have a, um, a you, that's, the time, that, that's the point where you really want to start to add additional people. You don't want just one person wearing multiple different hats. Uh, when you start to make big, moving from a, you know, a development, a short, you know, small beta, when you start to, to move and scale out, that's really when you want to start to bring in somebody else that can be, um, that can be that driving force and be that uh, consistency that you need to, to succeed. As we wait for Drew, there he is. Sorry. I'm, I'm completely unmuted now. I was completely muted earlier. Um, for some reason, the little can't hover and get it to show up for me sometimes. No worries. Um, so we've kind of talked about these components, but in that early design phase, it's a little bit of a different world than moving into a more um, a, a launch phase or a, a going into production phase. Uh, and some of the components that really need to be in sync here are the uh, system administrator and the app developer and the database admin because they're the ones who are going to see the real um, requirements of the site once real users start hitting that site. Um, to a degree, the content creator is going to need to be involved because they're going to know what's being um, put out there and what's going to drive uh, viewers and interests and things along those uh, lines, but um, you need people who understand ways to optimize that environment to respond to uh, growing traffic. So the, the app developer is going to be the one who can go in and ask the code to be more efficient, to clean things up to a point where that in infrastructure doesn't have to do as much work to serve the same number of, of viewers. Then you've got the system administrator who can work with things like, how do we cache this? How do we optimize um, the, the way we've configured Apache? Maybe we move to Nginx for one or more reasons. Um, and then the database administrator who can say, how can we approach our database in a way that's going to give us a more bang for our buck? Or how can we uh, move into replication with one of these tiers so that we can handle more load with more resources? And so now that we're into production, we're seeing, you know, what is the reality of, of running this site? And there are many, many tools that you can use to clarify this. And these are shows we've done in the past. So you can go and look uh, into the archives to see some of these things. But uh, once you're live, you start seeing reality. You start seeing how well your code performs, how well the infrastructure performs, the solution that's been built out to handle this project performs. And uh, once you're comfortable there, you move into steady state where really um, it's, it's maintenance mode. You have the content creator putting additional content out there in collaboration with the system administrator saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to put a blitz of things that I expect will go viral. Um, are we ready for that? Can we prepare for that? And then the system administrator who's doing maintenance, making sure their components are patched and up to date, making sure that passwords are being rotated, everything's secure doing many of the tasks that are kind of normal day-to-day -day tasks that uh, need to be taken care of to maintain a site well. They can do this manually. They can do this with some of the DevOps tools that we've discussed in the past uh, around uh, tracking logs using uh, code deploy from Git, using uh, content management and uh, configuration management tools that will help them keep tabs on these things. Um, but things ought to be uh, relatively uh, streamlined during steady state. Um, at some point, you get to the 2.0 phase where you have something live, you have something real, you're going to make some substantial changes. 
maybe a little bug fix here and there, maybe a total overhaul. But then you start reintroducing some of the components we discussed earlier into the conversation to get them uh, moving towards uh, providing that extra functionality or cleaner UI or uh, better performance, whatever the case may be. Um, the database administrator, the app developer, the web designer you can be brought back into the conversation with their expertise to really keep things uh, moving uh, upwards and to the right. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we really uh, that we really preach quite frequently here is uh, doing a lot of load testing, you know, before you release, and and that absolutely will help. It'll it'll really shorten up a lot of that, um, uh, you know, cycle during production. But really, you can't predict what your actual load is going to be until it actually happens. And so um, the the reality is that you do need to. Uh, you know, continue to monitor those uh, th those metrics and, and adjust performance based on what you're actually seeing. Um, that might mean uh, pulling back some of the resources that you're using. It might also mean that you need to um, add additional resources that you didn't foresee. I mean, if you if you load test for uh, you know something that would simulate uh, you know 50,000 users uh, per day, and then you end up having twice that, um, you know, you're definitely going to have to to have to change things. And so, yeah, as you go through there, you know, you need to uh, do additional, uh, you know, I guess, not necessarily testing, but additional um, taking of those metrics and, and, and applying them. And then that's when you, you know, those uh, database administrators, server administrators, uh, app administrators can work together with those metrics, those, those real-life metrics and say, you know, on Tuesday we had 55,000 people come and visit the site. Uh, that, you know, uh, required X amount of... Uh, server power. Let's see if we can uh, tune the application itself. Let's see if we can add more resources to see if that helps. What can we do um, on all of these different fronts together to uh, make a more performant application? Absolutely. Uh, there's often um, an approach taken where you hire out some of these components. Um, we often deal with customers who have brought a, uh, a project to Rackspace and the people who have built that project are a third party. Those people do not work for the uh, company full time. They are contracted. There's an hourly rate going on. Um, so as far as uh, maintenance of that application, that customer may have a developer on retainer. They may have a developer that they paid uh, in yesteryear and does not work on this project anymore. So any development work is going to have to be hiring somebody uh, new for a period of time, who can reverse engineer the solution, find a way to fix, and then they're out the door. So when you hire out that role, you run into uh, a couple things. One, you don't have to have that person on staff all the time. That's a huge benefit because those, uh, those skill sets are usually very expensive. Um, there's a trade-off there where you may run into performance problems and you won't have the ability to just you know, pick up the phone and say, hey, can we can we look at what we're seeing here on this page? It seems like there are a lot of complaints when people try to um, put in a coupon for buying this thing. We need to figure out, um, we need to figure out what we're going to do there. Uh, when they're in-house, that's not a difficult conversation to have. Um, when you don't have anybody, then it's going to be a little bit more rocky trying to find someone, pay them enough to figure out what's going on, and they have to pay them additionally to, uh, to solve that problem. And so you have this trade-off that, um, that you're looking at um, in that situation where it is ideal to, to be the guy who knows your code inside and out and how to fix it and massage it. Um, it's rare that that's the case because it just is. We, we see yeah. that all the time. Um, and so that, that role can be farmed out quite often is, uh, at a certain point of, of growth and monetization of that site, it really becomes uh, more and more uh, necessary to have someone who you can consistently rely on who can address code issues. Because uh, we've mentioned this before, there's a, there's a spectrum um, of efficiency. You can either throw more resources or performance. You can throw more resources at something in order to allow it to perform better or you can ask the resources you've already thrown to do less, create more efficient code that can achieve the same end goal without as much work being done. Um, you really limit your ability to create better performance when you don't have a developer available who can make those changes. 
Yeah, that's uh, that, that's definitely true. I want to touch back on another thing that you mentioned as well. Is you know, as a site matures, you you sometimes need to to make changes to the application itself. I think there are some sites that, that don't necessarily need that. Those are going to be your more static sites, more more of like a a blog site. It might it, it undergo a um, it, it will the, the, these often undergo iterations. You know, version 1.5, 2.0 of, of the site. But um, that's where I think we see a lot of people bring in additional efficiency. So um, there are uh, applications that, um, you know, one of the ones I've talked about on here before is Untapped. They're always looking, like you said, that that uh, uh, making efficiencies on the application level and on the, you know, on the infrastructure level together. Um, whereas you might look at a, at a at a blog that face that stays fairly static. Obviously, there's new content every day, but the actual application itself, the uh, content management system that runs there, that stays pretty stable. But then as, um, you know, at certain intervals, you might have in parallel, uh, you might have a developer that is, you know, hey, let me, you know, let me inch away at this and, and take care of a couple of different things that might make this more uh, efficient. And that's a more, uh, you know, a slow and steady kind of a, um, a paradigm to uh, getting, uh, to improving your site. Whereas you have others that are uh, much more of a fast and um, frequent iteration, where they uh, you know they'll, they'll change things quite frequently, uh, sometimes even multiple times per day, as they try to find that maximum efficiency. And so there's a couple of different uh, different ways to uh, to go about that. And so you'll, you'll potentially find yourself with different uh, different scenarios with different uh, applications. Uh, absolutely, and and you mentioned. Uh running a CMS, something that the code's going to remain relatively stable. Um, there, I asked a question before we kicked this thing off about what role a WordPress admin would have in this type of a situation. And um, a WordPress admin is someone who is going to understand the way WordPress works very well and would be able to keep WordPress patched, keep your plugins patched, interact uh, from the WordPress um, admin control panel to a very deep level. And so they're going to be able to do uh, some of that web development work because they're working on WordPress where they have a lot of pre-built components that they can work with, but they're not necessarily going in and making code changes. They're making application changes from an admin view. And so there's, um, there's layers to these things where you, you may be able to get away with someone who isn't uh, deeply knowledgeable in PHP or Python, but is deeply knowledgeable in WordPress or Joomla, and can use the tools that are being provided uh, with great expertise, and they can kind of split the difference a little bit between uh, maybe content creator and UX designer and uh, web developer. Uh, without being thorough experts in all, they may be able to achieve uh, pretty good results in a few. Um, but you need to be really clear on what your needs are and where you need deep expertise so that you don't find yourself in a situation where the person you have uh, on staff isn't necessarily going to be the most uh, expertise person, uh, the most, uh, there's a word, I have a word, but it's, I guess I don't have the word, um, the most ideal person to solve that problem perfectly. Yeah. Um... Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I think that you often see a uh, w which role does a is a WordPress admin play? Oftentimes, you see like something that actually comes in and, and administrators that is the administrator of a WordPress site, um, and that's oftentimes uh, wearing that same hat as the the developer or excuse me, the uh, the application developer, the uh, database administrator, perhaps. Uh, but then there's also the, that WordPress designer. That is not necessarily a. Um, it doesn't necessarily do any of the administration. They're the ones that, that build a beautiful uh, custom theme for your site that makes it different from uh, everybody else's. Um, so you don't have that default 2014 theme, or, or or even worse, like the 2012 theme or something like that from two years ago. Um, and so, so you have the you know the, the appropriate uh, look and feel to your site, and and that person oftentimes doesn't. Um, doesn't exist in that life cycle other than that initial creation of that um, of that theme, making sure that it works and all components work together, and then they might disappear until it's time to bring in version 2.0 of your site. 
Absolutely true. Cool. Well, I think we've really hit on um, these uh, major major players. Let's go ahead and kind of review them real quick. Um, let's kind of start toward the most public facing, and then work our way down the stack as we go to the um, to, toward the less publicly visible, and uh, kind of see uh, see what they are. Just give a real quick uh, final summary of of what we're what we're looking at here. So. Um, I think that uh, the, the most publicly visible most of the time in, in running a website is going to be that person that actually creates the content. Uh, that's the, the closest to touching the public uh, that, that any of these uh, would have. And that's going to be, you know, that's going to be your, your writer, your blogger, uh, photographer. Um, again, it might just be a, a one-person operation, but that one person uh, is going to be the, the, the closest to the public. And then, um, let's see, the next I think that we would look at the, um, uh, the web designer, right? That's going to be that, uh, in, in the instance of WordPress, it's going to be your, uh, your theme developer, your theme designer. It's going to be the person that actually creates the interface between uh, the application and, and the web. And that's where the, that content uh, provider, that content uh, creator is going to put their actual content. Uh, let's see, next on down the stack, we're looking at the uh, actual application designer, the developer, and that's the person that's going to um, put together the, uh, the actual application itself. In, in the instance of WordPress that we've been using already, that's going to be something that's already been created uh, for you, or it might be a completely custom-built application, and that's going to be somebody, again, that is, um, that is working with the actual code that runs the application itself. And that's um, kind of sitting between the, uh, you know, the the system that it's running on and the uh, the actual final look and feel of that. Um, and then that leads into that system administrator. That's the person that's going to uh, run uh, the, the server, the servers that they're on. Uh, they might not necessarily build the app itself. Again, this might be the same person doing all of it, or it might be uh, a completely different role. Um, a database administrator might or might not be in that same role as well. They're going to actually be, be working on the database, the back end. That's where you run your data tier. Uh, that sometimes that data tier is the most important tier. Uh, a lot of the things that we've seen lately as far as trends in startups are, are taking a look at data and, and running it through various different, uh, uh, mashing it up with other types of data. So uh, startup bus competition that we hosted a couple of months ago, the winner was actually a, uh, a startup that took data from Airbnb, the hotel uh, sharing service, a room sharing service, and, and try to figure out, based on your location, what can you charge to rent your, uh, your apartment on Airbnb. Uh, so kind of mashing up that data. That really is the application itself. So that, in that case, that's going to be a, uh, you know, a very, very uh, important role in the position. In something like WordPress, it's, it's very important because it's a dynamic website, but it's kind of fixed once it starts up. You, you don't really necessarily need to change that very often. And then I think the thing that we haven't really touched on yet, and maybe we can finish up on this, is, is the role of the system architect. And that's the person that kind of takes all of this and puts it all together. You might look at it as a project manager. You might look at it as somebody that has access to all of the hardware and, and, and puts it all together. Uh, in this case, you know, hardware doesn't necessarily mean a, a physical server. It might mean a whole bunch of cloud servers and, and cloud databases. But I, I think that that's the person that really ties everything together. I guess we can just kind of end on that. Yeah, and I mean, you're going to need that infrastructure um, in one way or another. And uh, one of the things that we've kind of glossed over because you can have this uh, served out of your closet, I guess, if you have enough. Uh, pipe to and from your closet, and you've got the resources there. But somebody has to be able to access this physical infrastructure. Um, if you're hosting it um, off your laptop, then as long as you have access to your laptop and it has access to the internet, yes, you're in good shape. If you're hosting um, on a rack that's co-located into a data center, well, you need someone who can go and get to that rack if there's a power problem or if there's a network problem or a drive goes bad. Um, if you're hosting with... Uh, company like Rackspace, then you may just need to rely on an operations group who can uh, ensure that those VMs run the way that they're supposed to on hypervisors that are well-maintained, um, and it may be hardware, um, just like the co-location where another company owns the physical uh, resources and can actually get to and maintain them. Um, 
there are plenty of people who like to, to run things in-house, and there are plenty of people who would much rather have someone else fool with raid failure in the middle of the night than, uh, than you get woken up and have to drive halfway across town or state or country. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the company I worked for before coming here, we, we co-located everything. But we had a very, very sharp team that worked on, on servers and did it. But, um, you know, we had a, a disaster recovery center in, uh, in Dallas, the primary data center was in California. And when things needed to be fixed, uh, you know, you would have to, if we needed to take the main application offline, that meant flying at least two people to, uh, to Dallas, where they are normally located in California, and uh, I think this is a great place to end the uh, podcast today, so... My recommendation would be, like we are having a fire drill now, please, fire drill whatever fire drill is doing. Oh, we got a fire drill, we gotta go. Thanks, everybody.